Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Wu Wei. And that is, of course, the Chinese conception of action, non-action, effortless action, non-forcing, as I've said in the past, whatever you want to call it. And um, Wu Wei is one of those things that whenever you get introduced to spirituality or um, Eastern wisdom or anything like that, you always fail at straight away because immediately whenever you're presented with the concept of Wu Wei, you want to try and perform Wu Wei and it's not possible to try and perform Wu Wei. So therefore what you do is you get into this um, kind of back and forth, back and forth of... Um, feeling as if you've failed at Wu Wei when all along you've actually been in Wu Wei because even the failure in Wu Wei is itself Wu Wei because the ultimate um, understanding of Wu Wei is that while you can never attain Wu Wei every single thing is already naturally Wu Wei that's a lot of Wu Wei's in one sentence so let me give you an example to this so uh, Master Eckhart talks about um, action, non-action as well. And Jung specifically addresses this in The Secret of the Golden Flower. And he says, uh, action, non-action, action, as taught by Master Eckhart, um, gave me the keys to open up, opening up the way. And uh, what Jung means by that is, there is also something else in The Secret of Golden Flower. When on the journey of cultivating the spirit and, and, and kind of building the fires of the spirit, let's say, in this alchemical tradition, um, then there is also seed water, which is relating to the anima. And uh, essentially it says that... Um, when you cultivate the, the spirit, don't worry about the seed water. There will be plenty of seed water present for you to, to um, move, move with, essentially. Uh, now, what this is relating to, it, it relates to this quote from Jung and Eckhart as well, and, and the Chinese philosophers like Zhuangzi or uh, Lao Tzu, who are particularly interested in Wu Wei. Um, and... It's essentially saying that the thoughts that you get from the external environment are the things that are within Wu Wei. So imagine um, someone in my flat uh, says to me something and immediately that sparks within me a thought. And I have some level of, let's say, emotion or affect towards that thought. And of course, we could explain all that scientifically with regards to neurophysiology and all of that underlying basis to it. We could explain it in behavioral terms as well. Stimulus and then reinforcement and um, consequences and all these different conceptions that would that would fit into um, these particular behavioral tendencies. Um, but if we take it from a more kind of as it is, you know, just as it is without trying to label it too much, that thought comes from the environment and pops up in my mind and I might have a little bit of an emotional um, kind of it within the realm of my thought, not, not within the realm of my uh, kind of language or anything or, or, or action but even just in the realm I thought I might have some level low level of emotion there as tied to that thought and that is the, the seed water that is the, the anima essentially and the spirit when it's harmonized uh, opposed to being kind of uh, afflicted with the anima in a sense or even kind of taken by the anima what the spirit does is it rises with that thought in action, non-action, in that immediacy, and then flows forward. And that's Wu Wei. That's living in Wu Wei. And um, 
And the aim is, essentially, to... Well, we could think of this as an aim, but we could also think of it as there is no aim. There is no need to have any sort of aim. But um, let's take it from that perspective that there is some level of aim in this. Um, and the aim would be to cultivate the spirit so that it is like, as Drangza says, the mind is a mirror. And what that means is that when thoughts arise... Uh, either internally within you as just, let's say, now, um, or when, let's say, I'm interacting with the environment and thoughts are coming up, the aim is to reflect those thoughts back into the environment um, upon the immediacy of them coming in, and then you, you push the spirit out again. When the emotional or the affective relationship with that thought bubbles over to the point where it actually um, kind of employs the spirit to come forth. But only, of course, when that happens. And that is a an automatic, spontaneous process. That, that your ego, your conscious, your consciousness, your conscious, decisive or rational mind has not really any influence in. And that's where the spirit comes in as an archetype. For example, when the Big Bang formed and the spirit of the Big Bang came forth in matter and, and, and there was that spirit, that, that kind of will that came forth and created the universe, that was an autonomous thing. That was an autonomous act. And so that archetype from a macrocosmic point of view was placed in man genetically as an archetypal form as well, and that is what's coming forth. That's the animus archetype in its most finite um, manifestation. In its most finite, that's the spirit coming forth. Every word that I say right now, because, see, Jungians like to say, uh, well, there's the animus and the, an the anim animus, and the anima, anima, animus, whatever, and... Um, you know, you can see those in people as archetypal forms when they come up. And that is true, that you can see them when they come up. But what Jungians generally don't mention, because it's superfluous, it's not necessary. But what they don't mention, and what I mention all the time in compensation for this, is the animal and the animus are here every second. The spirit that I'm using right now, the will that I'm using, is the animus. And I'm actually, I've, I'm getting thoughts in my mind right now. Obviously, I can't be consciously aware of all those thoughts as I'm saying them to you because it's a flowing process. It's almost like there's, there's unconsciousness implicit in my words that are coming out because I can't think about what I'm saying fast enough to say it. It just kind of happens. And we all have this experience. We all know that. And that is the union of the anima and animus coming forth. That's the union of the, the will or the spirit and the soul or the idea, which is the thought. And that's coming through me now. So it's always the anima animus, always the anima animus. Now, when the anima and animus are, of course, in this setting right now, as I am, we consciously perceive that we have rational control over that. But of course, as I've just told you, there's so much unconsciousness in my language and this has been proved from a neurophysiological standpoint with regards to the effect of the cere cerebellum um, on the language areas of the brain and on the expression of that language as well through, through me here as well and through my vocal tract. Uh, and there is actually a portion of unconscious control, of control of the unconscious within my language. And that shows the 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 almost pa the partial redundancy of ego control within that process. And uh, uh, now, when we see this fully, and we we can see this fully, is when we are unconscious of our actions. I'm looking down at my phone, for example, and there's something that I don't want to say to someone who's in the room, for example. And, uh, you know, I, I only kind of mildly don't want to say it. It's not like I, I really am thinking in my mind, oh, my God, I should never say that. I should never say that, anything like that. But I just mildly don't really want to mention it. 
Then I'm looking down at my phone and I become kind of unconscious of that as a, as a thought. And I'm looking down and then randomly, sometimes, you'll just say it. You'll just, the spirit will just call, come forth from you and you just say that thing. And it's, and it's almost like your ability for, for rational judgment and, and closing down things that you shouldn't say is just completely stripped away and the spirit comes for, forth. And that is when the self, which is the totality of one's personality in the whole, both the conscious and the unconscious, but of course, more control in the unconscious, has overtaken your ego, pushed through it a thought uh, and an, an idea that was necessary to be said in the environment for the development and the causal relations that are going on within that environment and for the psychological development of that person that, that it's been directed towards. And that is an actual, uh, that is an archetype pushing forth. And that is, as I say, the self using the animus through you. Um, and, uh, and, and that is, you know, this is idea of having a filter and having this. This is a, a kind of superficial idea psychologically because we all know so many times that we don't control our filter, that, that it just, something comes out of us. Just we, let's say we're in a, a dinner party or something like that and uh, everything's going nice and then you, you hit upon a, a topic, let's say, that's, um, you know, there's controversial opinions and you think to yourself, oh, well, you know, I won't mention that. But then suddenly something just comes forth from out of you when, when you're not really thinking you'll say it and it, you say it and you're like, oh, bloody hell, I said that, bloody hell, I don't... How did that happen? And you really do think you get this archetypal confusion in a sense, which is the sense that, um, well, how did I even say that? What, what happened there? As if you, you've you been taken by an archetype. And that is what's happening. You've been, you've been very, very finely and momentarily taken by the animus and it's just come out. It's just happened. And that is the same spirit as an archetypal experience as the macrocosmic, as I've talked about, the macrocosmic Big Bang. Do you see the parallel there? How the spirit of the Big Bang just popped out of nothing, out of, out of just, you know, this unconsciousness. And the language that you used, the, the words that you used at that dinner party, when you were slightly unconscious of yourself, it popped out of you. And it was spontaneous and just came out of the unconscious. That's the sa it's the same experience, um, and it's very very interesting that um, from a from a perspective of, of uh, psychology from a from a psychological perspective, um, and of course the spirit gets uh, kind of closed down, shall we say, or or it can even become deviated in a manner when it has a uh, or when the the ego has a. A poor relationship or a, a clinging to a particular thought or a particular idea, or a particular fantasy, even in their mind, um, and that's when the spirit becomes what you could say as uh, has a, a micro neurotic tendency. And when I say micro neurotic, I mean uh, it can uh, essentially over a number of minutes or a number of hours. Um, uh, the ego becomes trapped in this kind of uh, cyclical process of um, not being able to get over that thought or being fixed on that thought or, um, you know, being fixed upon that fantasy. Um, this can happen in many, many different ways. For example, you become fixed on a, a romantic idolization or you become fixed upon something that's negative, like, for example, going to the doctors to find out your results from a particular test that, you know, you had a lump somewhere on your body and you've got to go to, to this test and you know that it's in two weeks' time, let's say. Well, what most people do, of course, is they go over that, and even though it makes no sense and it's completely neurotic and it makes no difference to whatever is going to happen, they go over it in their mind, over it in their mind, because they're possessed by that anima in that thought and their spirit is completely debilitated because uh, because it's just, just constantly focused on that thought. And you see what happens with this, the phenomena of this, in work. Let's say in two weeks time, you've got to go for some results and you're afraid that you've got cancer. And uh, but you're going to work every day, let's say, up to that point. 
you see it in people's eyes where they're like glazed over and and then someone will say oh shouting you, you know are you all right are you, are you with us and that's another colloquialism that's another term that we've used that actually denotes the possession by an archetype um which is uh, you know are you with us that means that you're back in the womb from being possessed by an archetype. That's what that literally means. But of course, people who aren't aware of Jungian psychology don't know that that's the experience they're commenting on. They just say it as a, a little thing, you know, oh, you're back in the womb. Um, uh, and then we come back in the womb and they get, because they get, what they've done, when their eyes are glazed over and they've maybe got a blank expression on the face or maybe they've got a bit of a negative expression on the face is they're thinking about the doctors and they're fantasizing we've got this pre-conscious or or kind of semi-conscious fantasy of being in the waiting room or being in the doctor's office and what they're doing is they're playing out the the scenario and what they'll do is they'll pay, play out multiple scenarios and this might be quite unconscious this might actually not be fully in people's consciousness sometimes you can be doing this a bit more in the unconscious as well um, and they'll play it out one way, and they'll play it out another, and they'll play it out the, and, and the fourth, and the fifth, and they'll be worried about it, and then we won't be able to sleep, because their their spirit is uh, is so invested in this idea, and it goes round and round and round and round, and that's your neuroticism and all the rest of it there, and, and obviously, of course, if someone's genetically high in trait neuroticism, or has been socially reinforced by way of very, very bad experiences, either in their childhood development or later, um, then of course that's going to affect them even more with regards to this and it's going to give them more of a predisposition to this kind of cycle of thoughts um, and uh, and then we're going to go around and then the doctor's day is going to come they're going to be very very anxious they're going to be very very neurotic and uh, uh, it's going to come and, and whatever happens happens and if it's a bad result most likely someone like that is going to crumble uh, you know they're just going to crumble if it's a good result they're going to be like, well, thank God for that. But then they're going to be on to the next thing that they're going to be worrying about. And they've got a, they've got an anima thought possession around. And, and so that's that. Um, but all this kind of denotes what I'm talking about, especially with regards to the spirit as well and how that just comes up through people. Um, it denotes the autonomous nature of it. And it denotes the archetype, the autonomous nature of that archetype. Um, and, and of the, the kind of uh, almost fallacy of the ego, of ego consciousness. And of course, many, you know, I've looked into spirituality and stuff for, for a number of years, as many of you are aware. And, uh, you know, all of the, the gurus say, uh, well, it's about allowing these thoughts to come up and allowing this stream of thoughts to be separate from you, separate from any sense of you. Now, when we go back to that idea of Wu Wei, you know, getting back to this thing about uh, the, the start of the video and what I was talking about uh, with regards to that, um, this actually directly relates to that because you see, if you've got a uh, an environment, uh, a kind of a set of arrangement of, of people in an environment and then someone says to you oh you know I've thought about this and then you get a thought immediately and let's say you've got quite a strong spirit you've cultivated that spirit in, in an, alchem an alchemical sense or psychological sense whatever sense you want to refer to it as spiritual sense even it all fits in the same way anyway um, but if you've got that strong spirit then of course that thought comes in and immediately there is a reaction there or there is not a reaction. There might That thought, let's say someone's action in the environment might stimulate a thought in you, but it might not hit that affect level where it, it actually triggers the spirit within you and then you have an action out in the world. Uh, and if that happens, then the thought just goes down, dies down. Um, but you see what's happening there, you see. When someone has... a does a behavior in the environment and then you you literally get stimulated by that and then if you've got a strong spirit you, you're not thinking there's no anima possession there you're not thinking well should i say this shouldn't i say this oh god maybe i i won't say this what happens in someone who's got a mature spirit and who's very very high in their spiritual development is that thought will come in and immediately there's the reaction there's no anima there's no you know, worrying or attachment to that thought. Their mind is like a mirror. The the behavior of that person comes to them. Their mind reacts as a mirror. When they get that thought and that affect on that thought, 
it then goes back out immediately. They don't cling, they don't grasp. Their mind, as Drangza says, works as a mirror. And even if there isn't an emotional reaction, the, the thought comes up in them and you don't see a reaction and the thought goes down in them. That's all that happens. And they are not, there is no ego. There is no one person there uh, to, to experience that per se. It's just simply the thought. It's, a, it's the process itself. The process itself is what there is. Um, and of course, the person is fully aware that their autobiographical con consciousness, as we would say, their noetic consciousness, is merely a thought in itself as well. And it's a it's a persistent thought from the formulation of our neurophysiology that has, of course, um, been generated, been, been uh, in terms of, you know, it's uh, evolved in a specific way um, over the millennia. And, and that is just how it is um, compared with animals, which have no or very very limited at best autobiographical consciousness um and that's just how it is um and the greatest achievement uh in any sort of uh not even in a spiritual way but in a it, generally in a psychological way is for someone as a human being to attain the same level of wu wei as an animal has because an animal uh, generally we know psychologically but most animals live in what's known as the here and now that is to say they don't have what i've just talked about being referred to as an autobiographical sense of self that means that they know that they are they know they are experiencing and they they know that they've had a past and they know that they've had a future they have memories they have expectations they have prospective memory that's to say future uh, future expectation uh, there with regards to to their life they don't have any of that they generally just have this here and now consciousness and that is very zen and that is very wu wei and all the rest of it uh, and that's why they always say that uh, the buddha nature can be found in in animals of course josh Yu's famous uh, uh koan says uh, one student says does the uh, does a dog have the buddha nature and josh Yu says moo no, um, but of course that's relating to the conceptual framework of a dog being a social construct and of course therefore a dog can't have the Buddha nature because um, a dog doesn't exist. But of course there is much deeper levels to it than that. That's merely a, a superficial level of, of, of Zen um, that actually within that kind of framework, Joshua is working as someone who is trying to instill Wu Wei and instill the, the Zen mind, the mind of a mirror in that student who who isn't like that, who is actually quite worried and quite kind of within the great doubt. Uh, and so Joshua in, in saying very directly, Mu, no. The, the Zen student might be liable to take that, as I've just said there. Um, oh, well, of course, the dog is a social construct. And so the dog can't have a Buddha nature because dogs as a concept in language doesn't exist. That's not it. That's not it. And the Zen student thinks that's it. And then we think, well, I've really claimed something here. I'm a good Zen guy. I know what I'm doing. I'm great. I've got every minute Zen. I'm, I'm walking on bowling. Uh, and, and then something comes along that makes him doubtful. Then the emotions come along. Then the things come along to trigger that person. And so the master has to keep going, keep plowing and, and give that person all of this kind of spirit and, and, and really work them through those emotions and that, that path to be able to get them to that mind of a mirror. And... Uh, so all of these things kind of kind of come into it, and um, it's very very interesting when uh, you know we we think about these things and we can kind of um, understand how um, uh, these things work not only with regards to um, uh, various different you know it's like it's in spirituality, it's in psychology, it's in religion, mythology, uh, and it's even within our our scientific understanding. Um, with regards to the, the flow of thoughts and with regards to this thing of, of not experiencing things, but, but having um, a sense of wu wei and a sense of flow um, that, is, that is aside from these things. And, um, and uh, so these animals specifically, you know, when people are saying, 
they have the Buddha nature. And, and funnily enough as well, Alan Watts talks about this when uh, he met um, DT Suzuki and he talked about DT Suzuki where uh, he was playing with a kitten or something like that and he uh, and, and Alan Watts said, uh, you know, when I was looking at him, I could see that DT Suzuki was just piercing right into the Buddha nature of this kitten. And uh, you can see that quite easily within, as I've talked about before, within Chopinian philosophy. Um, when you're looking at an animal, and, uh, and and this is within the will and idea of a yin and yang, um, uh, well, yang and yin respectively, of course. And uh, when, let's say, a, a dog is chasing after another dog or something like that, you see their eyes light up. And immediately, that emotional affect crosses the border into spirit. So they get the idea, they can see the dog in front of them that's on the field running around. And immediately, that affect in their brain, you know, as a part of the mammalian limbic system, crosses the threshold to actually having a motor reaction. Um, and then, um, that, of course, has the reaction and goes out. And that is the Buddha nature that see the idea you go and that's of course a very um that there's a lot of zen in that as well um uh, but that encapsulated within this framework that i've talked about of Wu Wei, with the mind being a mirror uh, and, and and not having any attachment to thoughts per se and you thought comes up and then goes away action goes out and then goes away in that specific way that zen that's Wu Wei. That's what um, is is the ultimate. But um, it's uh, if there's any sense of attachment, if there's any sense, whenever that sense of ourselves come in, if that sense of my autobiographic biographical consciousness coming in, my ego sense of self, shall we say as well, um, in the moment comes in, um, then I've lost it. But you've only lost it if you think you've lost it. Well, not even if you think, but if you believe you've lost it. Because even losing it is within Wu Wei. Because don't forget, um, everything, uh, all these behavioral tendencies that are coming into you, you know, from the environment, all these actions are actually formulating those thoughts in your mind of, oh my God, I've lost it. And if you can distinguish that that itself is a happening from the larger causal environment, and that, that isn't actually you, but that's, again, the, the, the whole causal process working together as one, then what we can see is that we haven't lost it. You're in it again. But you see, what any Zen student has to go through is a constant battle of that for months and months and months, years and years and years of daily precision, daily training, meditation, um, uh, self-remembering exercise of Gorgeff, things like that, all these types of things in a Jungian manner, the, the picking up on the archetypes and when the archetypes are coming through you, the anima, animus, etc., um, to be able to realise that they haven't lost it, to be able, and, and then what we can do is we can be really zen because they can lose it and, and still get it, you know, man, now that's a bloody hard thing to do, the, the zen of not being zen, essentially, you know, now that's, that's only for um, later life, that's not for, for young people, and especially not for a young person like me, so um, that is, you know, that's a, uh, and that's an incredibly, incredibly uh, high level spiritual thing, and spiritual development, Um and also it's with regards to fear as well. Um, you can ha kind of have this um, zen of, uh, of not being zen with regards to fear. So when, let's say you've got something coming up, like you, uh, you're you going to jump out of a plane, okay? And you know you're going to jump out of a plane tomorrow. And uh, uh, you can actually be uh, crying and be as fearful as you want. Let's say that morning... Um, you're crying and you're being fearful and all that sort of stuff um, and you're bawling and all the rest of it 
And then you get on the plane and you're a nervous wreck, you're like, oh, blah, blah, and and you can say to yourself, oh, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. Ha- I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to. You know, do all that and still be completely zen in this high level of experience. And but so long as when you get to the experience, you do it. And even if you don't do it, you are particularly still living within Zen. But within this particular framework of Zen, with regards to the cultivation of the Zeniest Zen, let's say, you do the activity at the exact time it is meant to be done as it arises, even despite your emotions, even despite intense fear. Um, There was once a Zen master, as I've talked about before, who said... uh, I've taken it upon me to say yes to everything. You know, like in Yes Man, in that movie Yes Man with Jim Carrey, I'll say yes to everything. And uh, he said, and my heart is on fire. After after he'd done this for a while, he said, my heart is on fire. And, uh, uh, and, And so we can get all of these emotions, we can get all of this intensity, because what he meant in that statement was so much. It's hard for me to know what anyone would mean in a statement like that. But he meant, of course, the physiological strain of it. He meant the emotional weight of it, both good and bad in terms of saying yes to some experiences will be an elatory experience. Saying yes to others will be a horrible experience filled and fueled by suffering. But nonetheless, his his heart was on fire. And of course, the amount and the level of life you know, the exuberance and, and abundance of life in that situation, in that master, would, would have, of course, been incredible. Um, and, and it would have been living really, really close to life. And that that is essentially what it's about. Because imagine you are God, right? Imagine you're, you're God before any of this exists, right? Um, and then you think to yourself, right, I'm going to put myself into a human. What do you think God would do if he put himself into a human, but he said to himself, but I'm going to know that I'm God in a human. I'm going to know that fully. And I'm going to know fully, full well, that all of this pain and all of this suffering is just an illusion. And I'll be able to withdraw, meditatively speaking, I'll be able to withdraw whenever I want, and, and and come into this sense of godliness, let's say, even in this human form. What do you think he's going to do? He's going to just live out life to the best of his ability. He's just going to go mental. He's going to go wild. Um, he's going to do everything. He's going to do all the bad stuff. He's going to do all the drugs. He's going to do all the sex. He's going to murder people. He's going to fucking do uh, everything terrible. And he's going to do everything brilliant. He's going to do, he's going to bloody care for people. He's going to be a Samaritan. He's going to be uh, someone who um, just hugs random people on the street. He's going to be a bundle of spirit. He's going to be the maximum level of spirit possible. And then at other times, he's going to be completely flat. He's going to be completely exhausted. He's going to be completely tired. He's going to be completely asleep. He's going to be completely in meditation, he's going to be completely whatever the experience is, he's going to do all of it, every single thing that he can do, he's going to burn out his spirit completely, and then he's going to die, and that really, in one sense of the word, of course, because from a human moral, of course we have moral philosophy to consider here, um, that, that's of course just a thought experiment, but if we're including moral philosophy, and we're getting into and morals, you know, disregarding kind of express, uh, expressivism or anything, or, or error theory or anything like that in philosophy, that yes, okay, is a nice kind of dream of the young philosopher, um, really doesn't have solid application for the world, because not everyone can just be an expressivist and just say, well, you know, morals don't exist and all that sort of stuff, and I'm just going to do as I will and take on that Dionysian Nietzschean attitude. You know, we can't all do that or else bloody hell the world would be ridiculous. Um, But nonetheless, um, that, in a sense, that that culmination of spirit, that, that intensity of spirit, is, is what life is about. And uh, the proper way to challenge that, ch- channel that, in a sense, you know, apart from all the bad side of things, 
is in creativity and and as a create you as a creative vessel because of course the nature of the universe as far as we can distinguish in any sort of sense because we can't really distinguish anything about the unit the nature of the universe or the purpose of the universe but one purpose of the universe that we can be quite assured of is that there is some element of creativity because the big bang produced all of these different elements gases chemicals planets all that sort of stuff and that is in itself a, a form of creativity let's say there was a blank canvas of nothingness before the universe now there's something on that canvas that is so very some level of creativity there yes okay it might not be conscious creativity by some sort of subjective conscious superordinate being that we know or we think is god but there's some level of creativity there, whether that be objective, subjective, whether that be, um, uh, you know, from a, a system, as I say, in the objective sense, just a, a system that is completely blind to itself, or whether that's from a creative, subjective being, there is still some level of creativity there. And so if we dispel that or think about that on the microcosmic scale, we know that what pushes up through us and what is a, a good natural formulation is creativity and so the spirit placing the spirit in cre in creativity is a good way to obviously do that um and and to al also create your own um uh, imita uh what do you call it now imitatio christi i think that's right i always i always get that muddled up you know what i'm like with latin phrases i am absolutely some of the alchemical phrases i am atrocious with absolutely atro atrocious with but yeah i think it's the imitatio christi the imitation of christ of course um and the imitation of christ as a as a figure in your own spatial temporal relativization with that is to say within your era within the 21st century within the 17th century within the 23rd century and within your own uh, neuro, uh, well, I, as I would say, your neurological truth, the the things that excite you and the way your brain works and what uh, how in, the way in which your brain works and how that latches on to certain ideas in existence in a positive emotional way, not a negative emotional way, but positive emotional way. Um, like for example, with myself, poetry. Um, with myself as well, philosophy, psychology, things like that. Uh, pursuits that are creative in a positive way that get my soul going, that make me feel that positive af affect, that make me feel alive, that make me feel soulful, abundant, creative, spirited, etc. And that's the way to do it. And that's the way to pour out the spirit in a creative manner onto the world. Uh, and, and that, of course, creates the whatever Jung says, the spermatozoic world of spermatic world, um, the, the, the world in a, in a creatory sense, you know, the, the, in, in, in the sense of creation, that someone has created this laptop by the, the spirit, by the, the, the kind of pull of the spirit uh, or the investment of the spirit in the thought that they've had for it and then it comes into existence and that is the the animus bringing the anima the soul into matter in a concrete form um and and that has to be done within your individuality and it has to be in terms of your individuation or your psychological development it has to be done um in um a, a very very complex manner and uh in all sorts of different ways and in all sorts of different follies as well with regards to getting to that uh, true form of creativity and true sense of who you are as an individual by intense suffering through uh, dream work and through understanding uh, your own psyche and being able to lay claim to who you are, lay claim to your individuality. I'll give you a great example of this. Poe in Kung Fu Panda, I think it's Kung Fu Panda 2, great series that is by the way, absolutely brilliant, the three movies, uh, even from a standpoint of Zen and Taoism, it really is quite nice, um, there are um, 
slightly better thing, like, you know, or, well, not better, but just different, really. Things like Star Wars, of course, is another brilliant one. There's so many great Taoist conceptions in that that really do align to a lot of what happens and a, what, a lot of what is like. And I've touched upon this before, but one episode in um, Star Wars The Clone Wars, it's series six, I mean, it's called Destiny, the episode, or something like that. Uh, or it might be one before the episode of Destiny, um, and, and where Yoda goes to the this kind of home world of the Force, and he has to overcome his shadow, and he has to overcome other things of his of his psyche there to lay claim to being a Force ghost, or as I would say, lay claim to being a resting potential person, um, a, a, a being a, a, a kind of thought being after death. Uh, that guides humanity and that guides people um, by way of uh, an imagistic formulation in the psyche having behavioural effects on the living, um, as I've talked about in a recent video. Um, and so that's very, very interesting. And um, But going back to Kung Fu Panda, Kung Fu Panda, um, he, he basically says, in the set, as, as I believe it's the second movie, he uh, puts on... As he's putting on his hat, something along those lines, he says, um, I'm Poe and I'm going to need a hat. And um, he says it, I believe, after he's just got over the suffering and the, the, the anima possession as well. It's an anima possession in a very specific way. It's not an anima possession in a, oh, you're anima possessed by a romantic idolization or anything like that because there can be many many ways the anima kind of pulls on the spirit uh in this sense he's he, he's got an anima attachment to the past with regards to um his parents and his parents death and he gets over that and uh he, he then is his self and he's got his spirit he's claimed his spirit and he will he will protect that and he knows who he is and no one's going to tell him who he is. And he and he's going to let go of all of that past. And he's going to lay claim to his individuality. And his individuality, in a sense, is, is also tied to the physical object of the hat. Which is, of course, geometrically speaking, um, a, uh, a vessel of wholeness. And a mandala symbolism in itself. Because of its geometrical structure having such a close relation with the geometrical structure of the whole. Specifically in physics or in, um, in geometry as the ornithognal projections of the higher dimensions. And that is a macrocosmic reflection um, of the, the microcosm. Um, and even in the geometrical patterning of that hat. That represents that in a, a microcosmic vessel. And what he's doing when he puts the hat on is he is laying claim to his individuality in a very whole sense. The hat is also a round object, just like many of those ornithognal projections of the higher dimensions. And, and, and that is laying, laying claim to the mandala, to the self. Um, and he is there um, overcoming something on the journey to becoming a spiritual master he is overcoming um himself in a huge way um and, and letting go of the past which is of course one of as many of us know the fundamental aspects to uh, attaining a higher level of spiritual development letting go of the past i've experienced that with incredible intensity over a number of years many of you watching will have also experienced that with intensity as well over a number of years, um, and it's um, it's of course how it is. It's how it has to happen, um, and and so that's a very 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 prominent scene in that that series. Um, and of course, with you know the inner peace and all that sort of stuff, uh, that's absolutely spot on with with a lot of spiritual development. It, it's so um, incredible and. What really gives it humility and what really gives it a sense of fun is how um, committed Poe is, but he's committed in such a, a lovely way. He's committed in this kind of way of, yes, okay, he wants all of these great attainments and he's got a little bit of an ego desire in that, like any, and that is like anyone who goes down spirit, the spiritual path because if you don't have that spirited ego drive there or that will in the spirit, 
then it's not going to happen anyway. You're not going to attain any sort of spiritual awakening. You know, forget it. You need a bit of a bit of that ego drive. Um, but he doesn't have hubris too much with it, really. I mean, of course, there's times where he gets a little bit kind of like, you know, oh, wow, I, I can do this, I can do that, and all the rest of it. But it's never um, in, in bad taste. It's always, you know, he's, uh, he cares for people and he has emotion for people. And it's never like incredible ego inflation or delusions of grandeur or anything like that. It's just the process working within him, in a sense. And uh, it's just such a fun set of movies that really highlights um, how this person who was completely not going to be any sort of spiritual master has gone through all these processes, stumbled through them, just like some sort of, um, uh, you know, in, in some sort of idiocy, in a sense, you know, not knowing what they're doing, not having a clue, and yet they get there and, and they attain to those higher things, especially where he's... I think it might be the third movie where he's with uh, Uguay in the like the the higher realms or whatever they call it. I'm not certain, um, or some sort of like heaven like place where um, you could say the yin and the yang are, are, are concretized or whatever. I'm I'm, I'm not certain, um, and they're like golden beings, spiritual beings, and uh, he's still there. He has this kind of eccentricity and comedy with it. Where he's like, "Oh, cool! I, I'm gold," and he's, he's spinning round in the air and all the rest of it. And um, it, even then, you know, he doesn't take seriously. He never has the the weight of of what he's achieved, even though he does have the weight of what he's achieved in one sense, because he knows full well that you know he has attained to things that other people will never attain to. But yet, he has all of his kind of like um, childlike. Um, uh, desire or, or fantasy with it in a sense but you see it kind of always plays a beautiful line with um, you know it's never ego inflation it's never delusions of grandeur for the fact that it's quite childish it's quite like a child attaining these things and what a child would do how a child would react and so it always has a sense of innocence to it that that never makes you feel as if powers um you know, gone down a path of delusions of grandeur or anything like that with the knowledge that he's got. He always, uh, it's always light, it's always nice, it's always fun. And I think it really is a great um, set of movies. And I think that it's genius casting to cast Jack Black, Jack Black in that role because Jack Black just plays it beautifully. Uh, just the way in which he plays it is um, incredible. And he because Jack Black just knows about certain things, he just knows about uh, the world, you know, isn't so serious, it's something just to be, uh, to have a laugh with, and he can, he can be that spiritual person without being that spiritual person, even in, even in his life, um, and, uh, uh, and so to cast him in that role is absolutely genius, and, and, and all of these things uh, just, just get put in place in the right way, uh, with him as as Poe, uh, and and the way in which he can play it is just perfect. It just it, it is that perfect formulation of um, just humility, uh, a little bit of pride, a little bit of childlikeness, but also a bit of weight there as well. Also, what I'm not touched upon is there is a bit of spirit there in Poe. You know, there is that spirit there. There is that I'm not going to mess around, of course, as much as it can be for a kid's movie. But there is that there as well. But he he, he doesn't let the weight of that, of, of all of these great masters that he's been around or seen in the past, uh, he doesn't let that weight kind of... Uh, uh, suppress his individuality, suppress what he can bring to the stage, to suppress those childlike tendencies or even eccentric tendencies as well. Aside from that, you know, within him, he, he pours that out, and that's a very, very beautiful thing, and it's a very, um, a very lovely thing to watch. But yeah, anyway, I am going to go now. We've been on for 49 minutes, so I will uh, leave it there for this one, guys. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, I will see you in the next one. So see you very soon, guys.